just as going live still. Okay, so it looks like we're live. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to another Sussex Vision Talk. My name is Tessa Herzog and I'm a PhD student in the labs of Tom Barden and Leon Lanyardo. I'm really pleased to host today's seminar, which is a collaboration between the highly successful Worldwide NeuroTalks and the Sussex Levy Hume seminar series. The latter is run by the Levy Hume doctoral students here at Sussex University, where we host speakers exploring topics from sensation to perception and awareness. Uh, you can check the schedule for the upcoming talks for both the WWN talks and the Levy Hume seminar series at the links in the video description below. Um, so today I'm very, ha very happy to welcome Dr. Bevel Conway, who's going to be talking about the neuroscience of colour. Dr. Conway is a senior investigator at the National Eye Institute in the, labor in the laboratory of sensory motor research. So his lab aims to understand the brain processes by which sensory data are transformed into perceptions, thoughts, and actions. The work in his lab has been especially focused on developing color as a model system. And the lab uses a combination of techniques, including psychophysics and non-invasive brain imaging, including fMRI, uh, sorry, MRI and MEG in humans, alongside experimental fMRI guided microelectrode recording, fMRI guided pharmacological blockade and computational modeling. Dr. Conway is also a visual artist and he's written on the intersection between art, uh, art practice and neuroscience. Um, so I'm really happy to hand over to you, Bevel, so you can start screen sharing. Great, thanks so much. Here we go, let's see if this works. Okay, and... Now, all right, which screen do you guys see? We've got your notes screen still. Okay. Oh, okay. And yeah. There we are. Oh, it's good. Yeah. Are we good? All righty. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, it's a super wonderful privilege to be here. I'm just going to start a clock here because I want to try and keep on time. Um, there we are. All right. So, um, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation, Tessa. It's nice to meet you, and I'm looking forward to a discussion afterwards. Uh, before I launch in, I do want to just acknowledge um, the folks in my lab over the last few years who've contributed to the work I'll describe. I'll point out specific contributions throughout my talk. Um, so a broad goal of visual neuroscience is to understand how the brain generates knowledge. And as you heard, my lab's especially interested in using color to approach this question. And I admit that it might seem on the surface to be a bit silly because it's widely assumed that color does not really require much brain processing. As you guys all know in Sussex, fish do it pretty well. Um, and it, um, and in any event, it's often thought to just be a low level stimulus feature of limited utility division. Uh, so why would we use this as a model system? Um, it has been surprisingly difficult to quantitatively determine the benefit of, of color to vision. Uh, so I'm gonna go through a little background to try and motivate why, why we're doing this, why we use color in this way. Okay, so in a famous study, Biederman and Ju showed that for most objects, color doesn't afford much recognition benefit. If anything, color uh, recognition error rates are actually higher for colored images than for line drawings. Uh, Gagenfurtner and Rieger pushed back against this idea that uh, color was completely useless. They used an image recognition task and showed that um, if both the test and the probe images are colored, that um, you recognize and you get a slight recognition benefit. So th this supports the idea that, that color helps you recognize things faster and remember them better. But as you'll see from those graphs, the benefit is really modest. And it's not clear that this benefit actually relates to object vision per se. It could be a kind of an attentional mechanism. Indeed, for most objects such as faces, color is neither sufficient nor necessary by itself for recognition. So it's very hard in this uh, image to tell the identity of the face because it's an equiluminant picture. There's no luminance contrast. In fact, luminance cues are almost entirely sufficient to recognize most objects. And this is really why 
computational models of object vision, such as the original HMAX, very influential algorithm, don't incorporate color because you just don't really need color to recognize objects. Now, there are some data on the fringes. Color can aid face recognition, under, but under very degraded image conditions. So this benefit is conferred, for example, by enhancing feature segmentation, making the eyes and hairline more visible, and not because the specific color itself is diagnostic of the particular face. So as Yip and Sinai pointed out in this paper from 2002, you get the same recognition benefit uh, in a false colored image. Um, and again, this benefit is pretty modest. So most people can tell that that's Lady Diana, even in the black and white picture, but with the colored, either of the colored versions, you get a tiny little boost. Okay, so the upshot is that color doesn't really seem to be critical for object recognition, but instead seems to support a range of behaviors of indirect relevance to object vision. These include low level visual abilities, such as scene segmentation, so being able to parse objects from backgrounds using color cues, and high level processes such as attentional capture, grouping, categorization, memory, communication, emotion and reward and social cognition. So it's a vast array of behaviors. And I think this array of behaviors expands the potential objectives of vision. That is, when we think what is vision for, we often go to object recognition. And I think color sort of blows open that, uh, that range of possibilities and says color does a lot more. And for me, at least, I, I think these, these objectives of vision are at least as important as object recognition itself. The problem is we have very little idea how these and other behaviors uh, of vision uh, are enabled by the brain uh, and, and give rise to knowledge. Okay, so to make this overarching question tractable, how does the brain generate knowledge? I think it might be useful to sort of take a step back and break the question down into its two component parts, make them explicit. First, what are the computational objectives of vision? Let's not take it for granted that we know what vision is for. Um, let's try and spell it out. And then let, let's figure out how those objectives are implemented in the brain. When we have an idea about what vision is for, I think it's a lot easier to hunt for neural implementations. But as I hope to show you today, the reverse is also true. Sometimes uh, the quest to understand how the brain works can prompt a reevaluation of ideas about what vision is for. Okay, let's dive in. So a few years ago, uh, we ran some imaging experiments in monkeys to test alternative hypotheses about the organization of the visual brain. This is a side view of the macaque brain that has been computationally inflated to reveal a cortical sheet that would otherwise be buried in the cell seat. Now, a considerable amount of the macaque cerebral cortex is implicated in vision, indicated by this dashed ellipse. Uh, the tissue towards the back can be carved up by the meridian representations into the classic retinotopic areas of V1, V2, V3, and V4. But there's this large swath of tissue anterior to V4, the infrotemporal cortex, whose organization is poorly understood. And we were interested in trying to figure out how that bit of brain is organized. There are two proposals for IT organization, or at least uh, among the set, are the Swiss Army Knife proposal, championed by Nancy Canwisher, that calls for specialized modules embedded in multi-purpose tissue. So you might have an island of face processing tissue inside this tissue that's more general purpose. And the distributed concept processing model uh, championed by uh, Jim Haxby, which argued that Basically, all parts of IT are contributing more or less to, to most of object vision. So a few years ago, Rosa Leifer Sousa and I tested these ideas by mapping the relative activation patterns in the same individual animals to a battery of stimuli. And we found a large network of color bias domains in IT. So uh, th they're shown in the cool colors in this lateral view of the macaque brain. What's more, these regions, these color bias domains, were systematically positioned next to face patches shown in warm colors. Uh, the activation patterns seem to carve up IT into four sub areas, each defined by its own complete set of functional activation patterns. 
So these and other data we obtain suggest that infratemporal cortex is organized according to parallel multi-stage processing streams for faces, colors, places, and objects, and perhaps other stimulus attributes. So instead of just being a big mush, it's actually got these rather discrete stages to it. Now, the hypothesis is supported by anatomical connectivity data. In a large meta-analysis by Kravitz et al. of track tracing data, they discovered that the predominant pattern of connectivity in IT is parallel connections running along the posterior anterior axis. And they identified these four main nodes, TEOD, TEPD, TEAD, and TGV. What's super cool is these anatomical nodes align with the functional domains, suggestive of a beautiful form functional association that the anatomy is supporting this functional architecture that we discovered. Um, so taken together, these results suggest that the face patches are not some unique, weird set of islands of very specialized tissue, but they're instead one manifestation of a canonical set of computations performed in parallel streams along IT. And I think that's a really powerful way of thinking about IT. Uh, um, and it reconciles these two theories I introduced earlier, borrowing key elements of, of both the distributed model and the specialized model. The, the, the framework is appealing, not only because it matches the empirical data, but also because it comes with a hypothesis for how IT develops and how it evolved, which became apparent in experiments we did to try and figure out the underlying organizing principle. And I'll talk about those in a second. Um, I think it's also powerful when there are converging lines of evidence and there are new papers from uh, Sri Hassam et al. from Nature Neuroscience and Bao et al. in Nature that really support this, this architectural model, this parallel multi-stage framework model. Okay, so what's the underlying organizing principle that, that determines the structure? Well, a key clue came from Raphael Malik's group who found a coarse eccentricity bias across higher order object areas in humans. Now we ran experiments to determine whether monkeys have a similar eccentricity bias. They did, and in a very precise pattern. So besides the foveal representation in early areas, I've just I outlined it there with that big star, uh, and in area MT, that's that dorsal area there, uh, there were a sequence of foveal representations along uh, IT, there are three here, one, two, and three. And these representations line up with the functional domains discovered using colors and faces. So you can see them on the other hemisphere there. So that suggests that IT is organized by repeated eccentricity templates, perhaps inherited from uh, V1. Recent work from Arcaro and Livingstone suggests that this proto-eccentricity template structure we discovered is present in primates from birth. So the eccentricity template results recall Alman and Casa's reminder that a common mechanism of evolution is the replication of body parts. So we see this uh, in lots of domains, the, the vertebral column or the segments in Drosophila or the genetics of color vision. Um, the replication hypothesis has also been used to explain the expansion of retinotopic areas. So this is in Alman and Casa's framework, how we got V1, V2, V3, and V4, all with a shared foveal and peripheral representation. So our discovery of a series of eccentricity maps down IT suggests that the theory can be expanded. So according to this hypothesis, an ancestral V4 duplicated to create a primitive IT, which itself duplicated several times, carrying forward this eccentricity representation it inherits from V1. So the idea is that foveal biases within IT took on a role in computing faces, peripheral representations took on a role in computing scenes, and parafoveal uh, regions in between took on a role in computing colors. And I, I think th this hypothesis is quirky and interesting for, for lots of reasons, but one of them is it sort of relates to this weird question, what's the cognitive scale of color? Um, so if foveal representations are taking on a role in face processing, that makes sense because face perception requires the ability to parse objects finer than the scale of the object. So you got to look at the features within the object. 
Whereas uh, the far peripheral regions taking on a, a role in computing scenes makes sense because scene perception requires us to take in the entire visual field. Um, the color biased regions are situated in between, which should suggests that color is really serving this role on the level of an object. Um, and, uh, and, and we've done some informal work just polling people. If you ask them, what's the cognitive scale of colors? People are like, huh? But if you show them a multicolored object and you say, what's its color? Or what are the colors? Or how would you describe it? People will typically pick one color. That's the kind of handle that they'd use to describe the whole thing. Bevel, before, yeah. So sorry to interrupt you. The right hand side of your screen is slightly cropped and it wasn't too much of a problem before, but now it's interfering with some of the... Um, the is that still cropped there? Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering mm. if the format of your slides is slightly... Is it widescreen or so? I don't know. Or are you zoomed in? Not sure. We can, we can continue. It's just a very small portion on the right hand side. Okay on the right hand side. All right, well, so does it does it go through all of the, in terms of the evolutionary time arrow, can you see the arrow head? No, we can't. How much of the uh, AIT, CIT can you see? So in the fifth uh, globe there, we see up to the letters PIT. Okay, Yeah. all right, I'll keep that in mind. Hopefully so it won't be too much of a problem. We can have a go at changing the slide sizes now if you'd like or you can just press on it's up to you i'm not sure how to do that do you know um yeah i can walk you through it all right let's try okay pause we get to pause now <laughs> give everybody a chance to oh actually no that's break. perfect it's just gone it's gone full screen now so i'm hoping okay. it's full screen for everybody else as well okay here is that all right yeah, that's perfect. That's great. Okay. You can see there ahead. All right. Thank you so perfect. much. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, it's, it's good to be forced to take a little break anyway. Okay. So before we get too exotic, you might be wondering if the relationship of face patches and color biased regions we see in macaques is also evident in humans, as you might predict if the activation patterns reflect some kind of ancestral homology. The answer is yes. So in a collaboration with Nancy Kanwisher and Rosalie Fursusa, we showed that humans have the same tripartite organization of color bias domains sandwiched between face domains and place domains. This was published in a paper in 2016 in J Neurosci. So the results suggest that the macaque is a good model of, of the human case. And they're also consistent with this idea that color plays an important role in high level vision. Recall, IT, infrotemporal cortex, this large swath of tissue in both the human and the monkey, has been implicated in object recognition. In fact, we also found color bias domains in prefrontal cortex of the macaque. Uh, so this is just stimulus driven, these beautiful domains, again, uh, adjacent to face patches in the, frontal, in the frontal cortex. So take a step back. There's like as much tissue, about as much tissue involved in color processing in parts of the brain implicated in high level vision as there is involved in face recognition. What's all this color bias tissue doing? I mean, for one thing, it strongly suggests that color is not simply just a low level stimulus feature. And it returns us back to this question, what is color for? So the boundary between retinotopic areas and IT reflects a transition from retinotopic or retina-centric uh, organizational systems to a cognitive one. In other words, the, there's a transition in the brain from the back to the front that goes from how retinal information is encoded to how visual information is used in behavior. So it's this critical transition that turns light information into knowledge you then care about and can use. So given the literature implicating infrotemporal cortex and object vision, we wondered if there was some statistical pattern in the colors of the parts of scenes that people care about, as distinguished simply from the statistics in the environment. So my colleague at MIT, the linguist Ted Gibson, taught me that one way of determining what people care about, as opposed to just the statistics in the environment, is to ask them what they label. So we wondered about specifically the statistical distribution of the parts of scenes that participants label as objects. And surprisingly, there were no data on the color statistics of objects. To address this gap, Siva Ratnasingham in my lab analyzed a large database of photographs labeled uh, with label object labels. 
And these panels show random pixels from objects and backgrounds. You can see right away a striking result. The objects tend to be warmer colored compared to the backgrounds. This plot quantifies the results. To orient you, U prime and V prime are the dimensions of the standard chromaticity space. So our results show that objects differ from backgrounds along the U prime dimension, and animate objects differ from inanimate objects along the perpendicular V prime dimension. So I find this result really striking because it suggests that the dimensions of color space itself, U prime and V prime, do not derive from how color is encoded, but instead reflect the high level use to which we put our color system, namely the detection of parts of scenes that are likely to be relevant, objects versus backgrounds and animate versus inanimate. Isabel Rosenthal, uh, in my lab related the object color statistics to the color tuning responses measured with fMRI. So in this lateral view, regions showing high correlation of fMRI color responses and object colors are depicted in yellow, and they form this band along IT. So the results suggest that color provides us with semantic information that is contributing to the knowledge about the stuff in the world. And this idea that color reflects the usefulness of visual information as opposed to just the scene statistics is supported by the color naming studies we did together with Ted Gibson's lab. So here's the question. How many guesses does it take you to identify in a color array the chip I've picked out if all you know is the word that I use to label the color? So we both have the same array. I pick a chip. You don't, so I'm not pointing at it. I use a word. How many guesses does it take you? The answer is an indication of the communication efficiency of our language. And it turns out that across all languages, there is a striking universal pattern. So this tapestry shows color chips for each language arranged in a row, and they're arranged from left to right according to the rank order of the communication efficiency of that color within the language. And the languages themselves are ordered top to bottom according to the overall efficiency of their language. So at the top, you have Western languages that have very high communication efficiency regarding color, very sophisticated color, color naming systems. And at the bottom, you have um, uh, uh, less efficient languages that have uh, fewer consensus color terms in the population. But you can see, despite how fancy your color naming system is, there's this universal pattern that is warm colors are communicated more effectively than cool colors across all languages. And those statistics are actually related, or that pattern is actually related, correlated with the object color statistics. So the results suggest that the extent to which color is useful drives the color naming patterns, which helps resolve a longstanding debate in the color naming literature. But for our purposes, the results provide insight into the role that color plays and how we acquire knowledge. Color doesn't just tell you so much about the specific identity of what you're looking at, but rather the likelihood that it's something you'll care about, that it'll be an object. Okay, so there seems to be elements of a story emerging that IT uses color for object recognition by becoming especially sensitive to the color statistics of objects. But there's a hitch to this tidy account. The band of IT indicated by the yellow arrow that is most highly correlated with the color statistics of objects, that band does not coincide with the color bias domains. They tend to be ventral. In fact, if anything, the band in IT encompasses face patches more so than color bias regions, which is peculiar. Why? Because face recognition doesn't need color. You can test yourself with the selection of grayscale photographs of some luminaries in the neuroscience of color, you can easily tell them apart, even if you've never met them. The fMRI results show that the color signals influence many, if not all, parts of infrotemporal cortex. So we've got those color bias domains. They, they were identified because they show an, an overt bias to color over luminance contrast. But you also have this band of tissue with a bias for the colors of objects that encompasses the face patches. So color is too simple of a term. It's entering IT in lots of different ways. So Marianne Dweek in the lab uh, and others in my group, a group of postbacks, confirmed that the MRI was not misleading by doing fMRI-guided recording of the face patches. 
So they used a clever stimulus set that preserves the luminance contrast relationships of the faces while parametrically varying hue. And I can walk you through how you make the stimulus set, but the upshot is that any given face in the stimulus set still has the rich luminance contrast that the face system needs in order to respond to faces, but we can make green faces and red faces and so on. And sure enough, the population of faces on average was biased for warm colors. So there's the distribution of the population cell response. You can see it peaks to the warm colors and has dips to the cool colors. For reference, the dashed curve shows the distribution of face colors from Sophie Werger's large sample of spectral measurements of faces across multiple ethnicities. So the color tuning data are consistent with an earlier report by Edwards et al. that just measured the responses of face selective cells to natural versus unnaturally colored faces and showed that IT cells, face cells are often respond a little bit better to the naturally colored faces. The complete color tuning functions that we obtained uh, allow us to compute the Fisher information for the population. So the Fisher information shows what colors are most readily discriminated by the population. So, so can these face selective cells with their color tuning actually distinguish between different face colors? Well, there's a dip in the Fisher information that coincides with the peak of the distribution of colors of faces, which shows that the population is not actually optimally tuned to discriminate the colors of faces. So to summarize, face cells do not seem to be wired up to discriminate face colors. They're using that color information to do something else. Instead, I suspect the color tuning of, of IT and of the face cells reflects this other key organizing principle. So several reports have argued that infrotemporal cortex is organized by responses to animacy measured using shape cues. So this is work by Nasalaras et al, Shah et al, and Conklin and Karamatsa. They've really argued quite strongly that um, IT is organized by this response to animacy. And there are a number of other papers as well. So our results suggest that color could contribute to this organizational structure by playing a role in animacy judgments, especially those related to faces. This returns us back to this question. What is all that color bias tissue doing? They don't seem to be encoding the colors of objects, at least not in a generic way. So it returns us to this cycle of questions. One behavioral piece of evidence in favor of the notion of, uh, of, of the role of color in object recognition um, comes from that earlier study by Gagenfurtner and Rieger I mentioned earlier, that color helps us recognize things faster and to remember them better. And, and a big piece of data in support of that idea um, is that color and shape are somehow inextricably bound. Um, and the evidence for this comes from this kind of a demonstration where, where we might ask, what is the color of a banana? Uh, there's a number of studies now that suggest that um, the color you associate with a banana isn't just an association. The, the gray banana actually looks like it's tinged with yellow. And this is taken as evidence that the color and shape are processed together as two cues to object identity. Now we decided to test for these effects for both inanimate and animate objects using very rich shape cues. Um, and the reason really was that these effects, the so-called cognitive penetrance of color, the yellow tinging of the gray banana is thought to depend on the richness of the shape cues. So if you make the shape cues really, really rich as, as you know, lots of shading and so on, you get a better effect than you do if you just use a line drawing. Well, the richest shape cues we could imagine um, can, be, uh, can be sort of created by looking at the world under monochromatic sodium light, low pressure sodium light. So Mariam Hazantash and Rosa Lefer Sousa asked people to match the appearance of real objects and real people uh, while immersed in this room lit with low pressure sodium light. The monochromatic sodium light, it has sort of very narrow bandwidth, and you can think of it as a kind of knockout experiment. It doesn't, it prevents the retina from actually encoding color. And the question is, what colors do you see under this very peculiar circumstance where everything is essentially monochromatic or, or kind of weirdly colorless? 
So if memory modulates the colors of objects, then when retinal color encoding is impaired or disabled, then um, the color matches should reflect the normal colors for color diagnostic objects, just like the, the gray banana should appear tinged with yellow. But so, so, and we made that prediction that this should be the case for, for objects that have a diagnostic color, but not for objects like toys that don't have a diagnostic color. So we have a little selection of toys and then we had an orange fruit, a strawberry and a tomato. And you can see those at the bottom. And those tapas that tapestry there shows the color matches that people made 20 different subjects made to all of that array of different objects or samples under white light. And it recovers basically what you expect. Now, in addition, and we'll get to that in a minute, we also had people color match skin samples of real life human models, uh, a Caucasian woman and an African-American woman, we had two of each, um, and we'll get to those results in a minute. But for now, what we noticed right away was that the matches under the low pressure sodium light did not really distinguish between the toys and the, the naturally colored objects. They all appeared the same kind of washed out, browny yellow color uh, that's really just a color reflecting the illuminant. So we didn't find very compelling evidence for this cognitive penetrance of color on, uh, on objects, but there was one exception and that was faces. So of the two races tested, African-Americans and Caucasians, um, every single subject matched their faces with a striking green. So it wasn't the natural color, it was this paradoxical color. The effect was abolished when the face context was masked, showing that this really isn't just about something about the skin, it's actually the face context that's creating this paradoxical memory color. Now we did a detailed analysis of the color matches to determine the extent to which they modulated the long versus middle or the red greenish axis versus the s cone systems. And I'll dive into that now. So under these plots show the multidimensional scaling relating the first dimension of the, of the representational dissim dissimilarity matrix for the s component along the s uh, along the y axis and along the m axis is the lm component. So um, under white light, the skin of uh, faces and non-faces. So face skin is shown as black symbols and non-face skin is shown as open symbols. They're fully overlapping. They're indistinguishable under white light. People make the same matches to face skin and non-face skin. Uh, what separates the populations uh, is the race. Um, so Caucasians are in the upper left and African-Americans are under, uh, in, on the lower right. What's quirky is under the low pressure sodium light, you see a separation and that separation is selective for the LM dimension. So this is regardless of race, what we're now pulling out is a distinction based solely on the extent to which that memory color is modulating the red, green or LM axis. So I think this provides really quite a deep clue about the role of color and behavior. It doesn't tell us about identity, that is race, but rather about behavioral state. Now, although Yip and Sinna do not describe it, uh, I think their original observations or the figure from their paper provides a kind of clue. Um, don't you think Diana looks sick in the false colored picture? I mean, it, the most striking feature to me of this image is not that uh, color is helping us recognize her, but that, that false color, she just looks really, really ill. And in fact, um, many of the subjects, surprisingly more women than men, that was the only sex difference we found, uh, spontaneously reported that the faces under low pressure sodium light looked sick. So males and females both gave the same color matches. They both uh, dialed it in to show green, but the females were much more likely to spontaneously report that there was something wrong about the face. So um, these results suggest that there is some kind of prior that your, that your brain has some very rich information about the normal colors of faces. But we've already seen that these face cells, although they're tuned for warm colors, they're not actually capable of discriminating the colors of faces. But the behavioral results, the color matching data I just pre presented, they argue that it's not about 
discriminating colors around the color circle of faces, but rather colors across the LM axis. That's what the face selective cells are wired up for. Um, and if we replot our face selective, our, our color tuning data from the fMRI guided microelectrode recording, um, you can see that the cells on average have this ramp shaped tuning function. That is, they respond more to faces if they have higher L versus M content. And these ramp shaped tuning functions are very similar to the ones that um, Doris Tao and, and Finrich Freiwald and Margaret Livingstone have discovered in face cells for other face parameters, like the eye position uh, or the spacing of the eyes to the nose and so on. Um, and so it looks like this is one parameter that the face selective cells are sensitive to that gives them um, their tuning. And taken together, the results then suggest that the cells, the face selective cells, they're not discriminating the face colors, but instead they're encoding a prior about just the LM component. And that LM component is the dynamic component of faces. It's the component that varies with hemoglobin or oxygen saturation that tells you about emotion and health and so on. So we return to where we started. What are the computational objectives of vision and how are they implemented? So we haven't really addressed this question yet. We've still stuck uh, the color biased regions sitting ventral to the face patches. What are they really doing? Um, and I think at this point, we can go back to the, 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 this, the proposition that what is the color of a banana? Um, now, when I ask you what's the color of a banana, uh, we reflexively answer that it's yellow. And it's widely believed that yellow is somehow inextricably tied to object shape, so much so that the gray bananas are thought to appear tinged with yellow. Those are the memory color experiments of Hansen and Olkonen and, and Gegenfurt and I described earlier. So I don't challenge those results, they're empirical findings. There are some quirky features of those results, namely that they seem to, those memory colors seem to be most strongly evident for objects that have colors that align with the daylight axis, with the natural colors of the illuminant. And, and so it seems like the memory color effects recovered in those experiments may actually relate more to uncertainty about the illuminant than they do to um, the, the, the inextricable yoking of color and shape information. When I ask you, what's the color of a banana? I think really what we're asking is this kind of implied question. Um, what's the color of the bananas that you care about? And I, th I think that particular clause that you care about is especially useful or important because it tells us that, um, that, that color isn't relating to the identity, but rather to the behavioral state of the object. So as a banana ages, it undergoes a number of color changes. And those color changes don't really tell you much about the change in the identity. The identity is evident in all of them and in the grayscale object. The changes in color tell you about the changing state of the, of the banana and the extent to which the banana is likely to be meaningful to you. So when we ask what color is a banana, we're drawing on this implicit role of color as it relates to use, that is the cognitive function of color, which we all take for granted is to tell us about whether or not something is likely to be relevant. And I think, um, this then provides a good formal argument for why object recognition and color biased regions are decoupled in the brain. They serve different functions. So the shape biased regions such as face patches enable object recognition and the color biased regions constitute this trainable system that promotes the computational efficiency of vision by connecting objects with their likely relevance. And if color and shape were inextricably tied to each other, yoked to each other, then they couldn't serve these independent functions. So to test the implementation of this kind of broad hypothesis, I think it's useful to break the problem down into mechanisms that encode color, which we hypothesize are implemented in retinotopic cortex, and mechanisms that decode what color means, which I suspect 
depends on an array of areas in infrotemporal cortex and prefrontal cortex. The human lesion literature provides some tantalizing clues to this, these decoding mechanisms, um, and we can discuss that um, at the end of the talk uh, in, in a minute if that's of interest, but it, it, it's, it's a larger topic. Okay, so to sum up, um, I've shown you a bunch of data, and I want to try and stitch it all together. So we, we used color as a tool to try and uncover the essentially the organizational structure of infrotemporal cortex. And we discovered that there's this parallel multi-stage processing of colors, faces, places, and objects down the length of IT. And those results suggest not only that IT comprises the set of somewhat discrete stages, but it also strongly suggests that the face patch system or any system within IT isn't unique, but one exemplar, one example of a canonical set of operations that take place down IT. And I think that's really useful as a framework because it means that whatever we learn from one of these systems, we can use it to try and understand or create hypotheses in the other system. And in fact, this is one of the things we're doing at the moment is trying to figure out you know, for a specific hypotheses of what these stages in IT are doing, um, we're trying to use the, the full array of, of, of tools that we have at our disposal and information about face processing, place processing, and color, color processing. Importantly, I refer to these domains, these color biased regions in infrotemporal cortex by this cumbersome term, color biased regions, because I don't think they're, in, they're involved specifically in processing color. I think that is done by the encoding stages already by the time we get to the V4 complex. So we, don't, we actually know very little about what these domains are doing. And I think there's lots of very exciting work yet to be done to figure out how they work and, and, and how they afford this range of cognitive um, features that are behaviors that we use color for. One loose idea is that maybe infrotemporal cortex is actually parallel streams where you've got one stream or set of streams that are telling you what stuff is, the identity of stuff out there, and another stream that's computing whether or not you should care about that stuff. And maybe that's what the color bias domains are feeding into. So then we also uh, went through data showing that the organizational structure in the infrotemporal cortex is predicted by the set of eccentricity templates that are inherited from V1 and that then predict the organization so that the foveal biased regions take on a role in playing in processing faces uh, and peripheral regions take on a role in processing places and mid peripheral regions take on a role in processing colors. And that quirky question of what's the cognitive scale of, of color might relate to objects, which I think is interesting because um, all of the work I've described about color is about objects at a graspable scale. That is, we use color to identify that which we can then touch or interact with. And that may be partly why we don't, or languages typically don't develop color terms for blue until relatively late in the language's evolution. Because there, despite the fact that the statistics of the environment are flooded with lots of blue and water and sky and so on, there's very little blue we actually touch. If you try and reach out and grab the sky, its color disappears, or same with water. And then we talked about the high correlation between the fMRI color tuning functions uh, of voxels um, down IT and object color probability, which indicates or suggests that IT is organized by this color, uh, but using color information towards animacy judgments. And that color is sort of feeding into IT in lots of different ways, one of which is for that sort of animacy or, or, or coarse scale uh, object um, and maybe an intentional mechanism, and then these color bias domains that are really privileging color over luminance contrast that seem to be using color to do something slightly different. Uh, and those results then relate to the moving around the slide to the bottom right going kind of clockwise to the color statistics of objects and that uh, the observation that, that they are not uniform, that the colors of objects are actually 
quite um, uh, specific uh, that objects tend to be warmer colored compared to backgrounds and uh, animate objects uh, tend to be distinguished based on the V prime or the yellow blue axis. And those color statistics data, interestingly enough, um, are similar for, for artificially colored objects, uh, which is, um, I think, uh, instructive because it tells us that when you go about making the color of an object, you borrow on this kind of implicit knowledge of what colors objects should be in order to paint those objects. So we make stop signs red because natural objects tend to be warmer colored and we want that to be a, a salient object. Then we did these fMRI guided microelectrode recording experiments to test the predictions made by the fMRI and discovered that face selective cells do have this warm color bias, have this ramp tuning function through the LM axis, uh, which suggests that these cells are specifically using the LM ratio to tell us something about the dynamic or changing character of, of, of faces, chromatic color of faces. And then finally, I talked about the paradoxical impact of memory on face color appearance under these conditions where retinal mechanisms for color are uh, impaired, people see faces as green and that, uh, and that that color match is selective really for the LM axis. And I think tells us something important about the special role that color plays in social communication. And with that, I want to thank um, all of the people that have contributed to the work over the years. I've listed them next to the specific projects. I didn't talk about our magnetoencephalography work or our work in, um, in V4. Um, uh, if you're interested in reading up more, on the right, top right of the slide is the selection of papers uh, that I drew upon to create the talk. And of course, I want to thank our funding agencies, especially the National Institutes of Health, the National Eye Institute Intramural Research Program, and you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bevel. That was absolutely fascinating. And I'm sure you're getting lots of uh, virtual applause across the globe. Um, yeah, that was really fascinating. I really enjoyed hearing about um, sort of language development and the behavioural relevance to, uh, to colour as well. So there have been a few questions dropped into the chat, which you may have covered as your talk went on, but I'll bring them up anyway in case you wanted to add anything. Sure. So the first question was from Wei Li. Uh, asking, are the three fovea representing patches in IT sequential, or do they parallel, parallelly receive inputs from V4? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so the track tracing data um, indicate that there's lots of interconnection between the, the patches. So we have, we're right now in the process of um, gearing up to do some functional connectivity data uh, collection. We've done a little bit of, um, you know, if you sort of um, look at the patterns of fMRI activity in without driving it with visual stimuli, you can look at which voxels are correlated with other voxels just in a kind of uh, resting state. And we've used that kind of an analysis to look at whether or not these bits of brain are connected to each other, or at least driving correlated patterns of activity. But um, Wei Li's question is specific about whether or not that pattern of connectivity is hierarchical in the way that we you know, that may may be assumed given um, the, their sort of organization along the putative hierarchical visual processing stream down IT. And my suspicion is that the answer is they're not organized strictly hierarchically, that there's lots of feedback connecting between, the, between them. Um, and there is evidence uh, from track tracing data not guided by uh, the functional data showing what the, what the pattern of connections is. And it does look like you get V4 input through a lot of IT, maybe not quite as far as anterior IT, but certainly um, through central IT. Okay. Great, thank you very much. So the next one's from Tom Bardem. Um, Tom asks, could the warm color bias be linked to the fact that it's the midget system providing the information, which is numerically dominant, especially in the fovea, i.e. the brain simply gets way more warm color information than information about blues or shorter wavelengths? 
Um, that's potentially true. The, the problem with that kind of a theory is that we know in primary visual cortex, at least Kataras and Devaloy have argued that there's an amplification of the S cone system and that there's quite a lot of, there's much more, uh, um, there's much more responses to S cone stimuli in primary visual cortex than you would expect simply given the relative ratio of S cones to LM cones. So to the extent that the warm color bias we find is outside of primary visual cortex, beyond primary visual cortex, it I think reflects something active that the visual system is trying to do to recover that information. Um, that said, um, Super Team Ray and colleagues have shown that there's very high gamma in primary visual cortex to warm colors, to long wavelength sensitive, long wavelength colors, um, which is consistent with the idea that you've got a lot of drive to, you know, red. The problem with that hypothesis is that the midget system is not driving simply um, the L axis of the LM. Uh, uh, sort of, you know, the, in your cone opponent axis, the midget system isn't responding selectively just to the L pole. It's actually L versus M. And there are not two independent midget systems, an M minus L and an L minus M. They're actually feeding in in parallel to the cortex. So there's no reason to suspect that the midget system by itself would give you a warm bias. It would give you the ability to distinguish warm versus cool. Um, and uh, that I think is true. I think that is in fact where these where these data lead us is down the idea that that what evolution has done in primates is created an, a midget system that gives us access to that specific axis, the LM axis. Um, and the, the the piece about the color statistics of objects was really to underscore the point that that the um, the color space reflects the extent to which we use color information. And that is probably not an independent force from the force that drove the evolution of L and M cones um, for obvious reasons. The selective pressures are the things that made us get that cone system. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, so we've got a few more, so I'll keep going and then we'll, we'll move into the Zoom room. Um, so the next one is from Phil Bartel and he says, great talk. Have you plotted your data against Wilkins and Asario's vividness? Should we all become hylomorphists and stick to the four causes? Um, what was the end? Have we plotted it against vividness? Again. And what was the last part it of the said, question? Should we all become hylomorphists and stick to the four causes? I don't know what that means. <laughs> okay. I'm. Um, I, so I'm going to take interpret the question as something to do with saturation. That's usually what people okay. mean when they mean vividness. Um, okay. Saturation is a very, so I haven't talked at all today about saturation and how saturation is encoded. Um, and in part, it's because of the three standard dimensions of color that we appeal to, you know, hue, that is the thing that you use for a color term, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and so on. Um, luminance, contrast, the light or blackness, uh, and saturation. Saturation is the least well-defined. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems like saturation is the thing that maybe the brain is sort of most squishily adaptable to. Put another, put another way, I can take a given patch that looks very desaturated under one condition, change your adaptation state and have it appear very, very saturated. Um, and this is nowhere more evident than in memory colors themselves, where you know the, the colors you imagine in your mind's eye are extremely vivid, um, and yet there's no saturation that you can measure at all. Um, I think, you know, for those people who are interested in black and white photography, I have a feeling that that's one of the compelling things behind black and white photography is that it allows the coloring of those photographs to be left up to your imagination, which allows the colors to be really, really saturated. Um, in the development of color photography, one of the things that drives um, photography technology most strongly is the desire for more and more and more saturated colors. So we see this for HD televisions that now have, you know, more than three color primaries uh, because they're giving you so much more saturation. 
So there seems to be a kind of almost insatiable appetite for saturation, but mm. that itself confounds the ability to measure it. Mm. Great, thank you. Um, so the next question is from George and he asks, does the separation of objects and backgrounds and animate and inanimate objects uh, reflect primate visual space statistics or is it supposed to be a universal principle? Um, so the distinction of, uh, that's so the object color statistics analysis we did um, reflects primates insofar as primates, humans specifically, were the ones who labeled the images. So um, I, I actually think, you know, it's, there's this quirky irony that we call these things objects. They're the least objective thing you can imagine. They require a human observer to define what it is. You know, they, you, when I look out, you know, at the garden, there's not, you know, a set of discrete objects that are isolated from each other that I can be like, that's, objectively defined. It's like, no, I've decided to call that thing an object, even though half of it is occluded and I don't know what the texture is on this side and so on. Um, and that in fact was the point of using human observers to parse the images, to label the images, was to figure out, you know, if we're dealing with uh, infrotemporal cortex, a part of the brain we think is involved in cognition, that is in using visual information to connect to behavior, then we need to have some some lever on behavior. And, um, and so the answer to your question is, it's specific to primates, specific to humans, insofar as humans were the ones that defined what an object was. Um, and I suspect you could do the same analysis and people uh, have done similar sorts of analyses where you look at, you know, what does a bee consider to be an object? And then you relate what it considers to be an object given its foraging behavior to the spectral sensitivity of its photoreceptors, for example. And it's a similar kind of spirit. That's kind of what we're doing, except instead of relating it back to the photoreceptors, we're trying to relate it back to infrotemporal cortex. And the reason we're doing that is that we know that the photoreceptors in primary Primates are not just for color vision, they're supporting all vision. You know, cone photoreceptors are supporting black and white vision and motion perception and face perception and everything. And so to ask the question about the relationship to statistics of statistics in behavior to, to brain activity, we have to go to the right part of the brain where we think that relationship may be meaningful. And that I think is in infrotemporal cortex. Mm. Great, thank you. Okay, and the final question before we move over to the Zoom room, it's from Jenny Boston. Jenny asks, for the color bias regions in IT, do you find any differences in color bias or other preferences between the posterior and anterior regions? Um, we, so the anterior regions, what's interesting about the anterior regions is that they tend to um, show more overlap with face patches. So the further anterior you get, the less isolated are the color bias domains from the face patches. They sort of seem to kind of have a little corner of them that overlaps. And that's consistent with, um, with the color tuning that we measure with fMRI that shows that as you move for, further anterior, you might get more of a warm color bias uh, in, the, in, the, in the color bias domains. Um, we don't see any difference in the face patches between the posterior and anterior. So, so what's happening in the more anterior domain seems to be maybe inheriting that color biased, uh, um, color bias for warm coloring, warm color bias that we see in the face patches. Um, I should say that um, the resolution of the fMRI, especially in that temp anterior temporal lobe gets weaker and weaker because it's quite far down and it's a small chunk of tissue. And so um, our signal to noise also goes down. Uh, and, and so, you know, there's a bunch more work to, to be done. And I would be curious to talk to Jenny to figure out if she's got a specific hypothesis about what she expects to be happening down there. But mm. yeah. Yeah, great. All right. Thank you so much. That's all the questions um, from the chat so far. So I just want to say a huge thank you um, to Bevel for that fantastic talk and also to the audience for attending and asking all those questions. That was great. Um, so as I mentioned in the chat, Bevel is available for a more informal chat. So you can join us on the Zoom link, which has been dropped in the chat.
Um, and I also wanted to mention that the next Leave Hume seminar will be Joel Pearson on Wednesday the 26th of May. So I hope to see as many of you there as possible. All right, thank you so much. Great. All right, well, I'll stick around for a little.